Hello everyone, Dumelang, Sanbonani, Molueni. On behalf of the University of Cape Town, I welcome you all to this webinar entitled Vaccines in Africa for Africa. And the phrase in Africa for Africa is critical for this discussion. For too long, Africans have had to depend on health innovations from other parts of the world, particularly the global north. Most recently, the need for COVID-19 vaccines has highlighted poverty and inequality in Africa instead of addressing it. Today's webinar is a step towards a possible solution in the form of locally manufactured vaccines. The drive for a COVID-19 vaccine has brought into sharp focus the need not just for capacity for all types of vaccines, but also locally developed healthcare. The speakers and panel members who will present to you today provide just a, an example of the caliber of expertise that is now available to address the continent's vaccine needs. While most of them represent UCT, I want to make clear that this is not just a UCT initiative. We are proud, collaborate, we are proud to collaborate with other institutions on initiatives that will benefit the millions of Africans who need affordable, effective vaccines that will improve the quality of their lives. In January 2019, McKenzie and Company published a comprehensive analysis of the business, economic and public health potential for local production of pharmaceuticals in Africa. To summarize the detailed report, the authors conclude that the prospects for such an endeavor present what they refer to as a mixed bag across the continent. But they argue in favor of creating an African pharmaceutical industry within regional hubs that are based in countries where increased local production of pharmaceuticals would be both feasible and have a posit positive impact on people's health as well as local economies. To be sustainable, they advise the industry's business formula would have to take an appropriate account of quality production capacity, drug product formulation and value chain effects. McKenzie published that report 11 months before the, the first known case of COVID-19 was reported in Wuhan, China. And since then, the pandemic has brought into sharp relief the need for countries in the global south to have their own vaccine production capacity. Two examples of local potential to help meet that capacity involve plant-based manufacturing. UCT researchers recently reported a successful near full-length coronavirus 2 vaccine spike in plants. And K Biofarms, a UCT spin off company, last year received a multi million rand capital injection to fast track the production of affordable plant based rapid diagnostic COVID 19 test kits. Of course, developing a pharmaceutical industry requires careful evaluation of our capacity and potential sustainability. We want to approach this important discussion with our eyes open to the different challenges and complexities, we, as well as the benefit of local vaccine production. To that end, we have invited Dr. Patrick Sunshong, the Executive Chairman of Inno Immunity Bio, to launch our discussion. Dr. Sunshong is a South African-born physician and philanthropist who has devoted his career to understanding the fundamental biology, driving life-threatening diseases, and translating these insights into medical innovations with global impact. In September this year, President Cyril Ramaphosa welcomed Dr. Sun Xiong's announcement of an ambitious initiative to build capacity for advanced healthcare in Africa. In partnership with the CSIR and the South African Medical Research Council, as well as UCT and the universities of Stellenbosch, KwaZulu-Natal, and VETS networks, the multinational corporation Dr. Sun Xiong founded will transfer biologic manufacturing technology for COVID-19 and cancer vaccines and next generation cell-based immunotherapies. This will enable the rapid clinical development of next generation vaccines for infectious diseases and cancer at, at centers of excellence across the country. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Patrick Sun Xiong today because like me, he and his wife are vetsies. Uh, his wife, Michelle Chan Sam, studied at vets as well as uh, Dr. Sun Xiong. Um, they have a heart for saving Africa as well. He was born in Port Elizabeth and Michelle was born in East London. Dr. Sun Xiong 
has said in a previous interview that he and his wife both come from Hakka families, a Chinese subgroup who traditionally believe in total community collaboration and the complete equality of women, even as potential warriors. They experience the inequalities of apartheid while they grew up here in South Africa. Dr. Sung Shiong was the first Chinese intern to actually work in a white hospital in South Africa, while Ms. Chan Sam was the first Chinese student in a South African drama school. As she said, it's given us an appreciation for how hard you have to fight for what you want, and it has made us a family of risk takers. We are delighted that Dr. Patrick Sung Shiong has decided to take this risk to invest in capacity in Africa, a risk that many investors haven't done over the years. And we appreciate the fact that as UCT, we are part of this drive. And Dr. Sung Shiong, we can't wait to welcome you to Cape Town and see you sometime in the corridors of UCT. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'll hand over to you for your keynote. Thank you so much for the honor of asking me to, um, for having me giving the opportunity to present to uh, Vice Chancellor. And I think um, the title of your uh, webinar is so incredibly appropriate, oh, Vaccines in Africa from Africa. And as I, uh, as you sh shared with uh, the audience, uh, next slide, Phil, the opportunity for me to come back home, um, and this is a very brief history um, as I was born in South Africa, graduated at Bits, and in, uh, as an intern went to Chinesburg General Hospital, and in 1976 um, volunteered at Baraguana during the Soweto uprisings, and in 1977 spent some time in TB clinics uh, in the Eastern Cape, and I think that seared in me the need. Um, that the country and in fact the continent has um, for I think 21st century technology, which then made the decision, next slide, for me to leave the country. And over the next 40 years, um, I had the incredible fortune of going from Canada to UCLA in 1978 to UCLA in 1980 and then working with amazing scientists at NASA and NIST um, as part of the space shuttle program and part of the nanotechnology program from 1996, which enabled us in 2001 and to 2008 to drive to build um, manufacturing capacity for nanoparticles. And on the right hand side of this um, graph here you see uh, American Pharmaceutical Partners is a company I ran, next slide, uh, previous slide please, um, in which we were able to make a million vials a day of 150 um, FDA approved injectables. Most importantly in 2007 there was the heparin crisis in the United States in which unfortunately 80 people died from heparin toxicity uh, of a contaminant and we were the supply of heparin uh, for the country. And that really imparted upon me the need to have manufacturing capacity. It took us a decade to build the manufacturing capacity in order to provide a million vials of 150 FDA approved products at APP. By 2010, uh, we had also built this uh, manufacturing plan to build and the particles. So we were steeped in the idea of um, manufacturing needs in order to advance um, technology, especially in today in the world of biologics. And what formed my biological path, the next slide, was my tenure at UCLA, in which um, my goal there was to suppress the immune system in the form of pancreas transplant. But I had a conflicting goal, next slide, was also treat cancer patients, pancreatic cancer patients. And in this case, I wanted to penetrate the tumor so that I could affect the immune system. 
and this was became a vaccine, um, this nanoparticle of chemotherapeutic agent that by 2005 was approved by the FDA in 2012 for lung cancer, breast cancer, and by 2014 for pancreatic cancer. By 2010, it was very clear to me uh, that the era of human therapy was about to dawn because a Braxane was the beginnings of that. What it did for Braxane, it started to unleash a very complex orchestration of the immune system through the thing called the macrophages and stimulated what we call M1 macrophages to kill the tumor. But it was very clear to me that T cells and NK cells was necessary. And that's the next slide, launch the program, my quest of understanding and harnessing this immune system, next slide, which is a complex interplay of memory killer T cells, dendritic cells and natural killer cells. If one could harness your own body and activate the natural killer cell and activate the memory killer T cell, you would generate memory, not just for cancer, but memory for any infectious disease, whether it be COVID, whether it be influenza, whether it be chikungunya, and Zika. Um, and the orchestrator was this dendritic cell. And this complex interaction then took me the next decade. On the left-hand side, this video will play, you begin to see this thing called the natural killer cell. And this natural killer cell is from the day of the Cambrian ages, billions of years in evolution, where it would recognize any infected cell or any cancerous cell. And we have this thing called the INKT cell that is recognized in TB. And it was very clear that if we could harness this natural killer cell on the left-hand side by growing an unlimited supply of these natural killer cells, of extracting these natural killer cells from your body and proliferating them into billions of doses, we could actually change the paradigm, not just of cancer care, but of infectious diseases. However, what was also important on the right-hand side is the crosstalk between the natural killer cell and the killer T cell. And the killer T cell would actually see, again, infected viruses, and cells infected with viruses. This is the challenge that I said we need to take on with regard to COVID. While the antibody-based vaccines may generate some T cells, it does not generate sufficient the robust, what we call memory, so that long-term you have durable um, uh, protection. We took this program on first in cancer, so the next slide, and then started on that quest. And the first thing we needed to do, as this video will show, was to build a campus um, of excellence of understanding the biology at the genomics level. And this does at SERI, uh, which is the Center for Epidemic Response and Innovation with the University of Stellenbosch, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and, and now it hopefully a Tigerberg Hospital. Uh, we will launch together with uh, University of Stellenbosch and Dr. Tulio de la Vera, this um, Center for Genomic Excellence. But as you can see below, these number of facilities where research campus, where you put together scientists, manufacturing scientists, biologists, mathematicians, computational scientists to understand. Um, and so from 2010 to 2021, next slide, what we did was, in fact, do that. And in order to harness the immune system, it became clear that you need multiple pillars, what they call platforms of technology. On the left-hand side, you saw the cellular therapies. You need a platform of advanced manufacturing techniques, of sophisticated manufacturing techniques to grow these cells, because these are the cells you will infuse as therapeutics which require aseptic manufacturing knowledge, uh, knowledge of how to proliferate these cells, how to formulate these cells, how to freeze these cells so they can be transported anywhere. The next platform, uh, as you, and you're all familiar with these platforms, is the RNA. But not just uh, the modified RNA, 
which is the basis of the BioNTech and the Moderna, but a new form of RNA, which we call self-amplifying RNA, in which one could then put the self-amplifying RNA um, into a vaccine. And that's the program which we'll share with you. The third pillar here is the adenovirus um, for, as a gene therapy as well as a cancer therapy, but not just a standard uh, adenovirus, but an adenovirus that has been depleted of any ability uh, or reduced ability to create antibodies against that adenovirus, a second generation adenovirus. So now you'd have an RNA and a DNA uh, combination of a vaccine. And then the third arm is subunit proteins. And you will hear today from uh, Ed Rabicki um, and Annalise and the University of Cape Town's um, innovations to have plant-based technology in which subunit proteins could be manufactured in a very low cost way. There are other ways of making subunit proteins, including um, uh, yeast or PQ yeast. These proteins will require and the adjuvant technology platform. So these are the four key pillars. The challenge was for us in the United States, how do we activate all of these four pillars? And as you will see later in my talk, we simultaneously activated all these four pillars by creating over 15 manufacturing sites across uh, the United States to create the GMP large scale manufacturing for cellular therapy, uh, RNA therapy, DNA therapy, adjuvants, subunit protein, and soon plant-based technology. So let me divert a little bit uh, into some of the two, two arms of the technology, and let's start with the vaccine, because clearly um, COVID has uh, put us into a position uh, that a, a pandemic has arisen, and we need to create capacity, not just for um, Africa, but for the world, which means you really need to understand the opportunity to create multiple platforms of what we call now in the in the press of mix and match. Scientifically, this is heterogeneous proteins in which or vaccine platforms in which you can take a DNA vaccine, an RNA vaccine, a subunit vaccine, um, a adjuvant based vaccine, and um, mix and match them. There are two really important reasons for that. One, it appears that it gives you the best uh, um, durable immune protection, but it also reduces the cannibalization of raw material and supply chain, so you could manufacture all simultaneously. The other thing, if you're looking at this slide, is um, the re realization that the nuclear cap The nuclear capsid, which is the innards of the, of the virus, does not mutate as often as the spike. And if you have a vaccine that has both spike and nuclear capsid, you have the opportunity to really overcome any mutational variants. And in fact, we showed that. When we did the S plus N in our preclinical and clinical data, now showed that our uh, vaccines uh, both obliterate um, every variant, and very excitingly, in our non human primate studies. Uh, destroys the infected cell so that even after a viral challenge, there's no viruses in the nose and lungs. I think that is the key to the ending of this pandemic um, and not allowing this to be an endemic. But this platform allows us to then go after multiple other vaccine platforms, whether it be TB, chikungunya, cystomyosis, yellow fever, um, as well as cancers like Burkitt's lymphoma, um, HPV positive lymph uh, cancers. These are tumors and infectious disease of Africa. Um, and it's really important that this technology platform is to be made available um, at the 21st century level under standards that would meet FDA, EU, international standards. So let me speak a little bit to those three platforms. The next slide. And these three platforms are on the left-hand side, the DNA platform, and the way we 
uh, in, uh, vaccinated with the DNA platform is with a second generation adenovirus um, that does allow multiple injections. We've now done this in multiple clinical trials in the United States uh, in cancer patients uh, with uh, the National Cancer Institute and show that we can generate specific T cells to the cancer as well as now specific T cells to S and N of the COVID. On the RNA, which is downstream of the DNA, is two or two platforms. One would be the modified RNA, which is currently in 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 uh, use in the in the world. But the next generation is the self-amplifying RNA, with the next generation of a nanolipid structure, uh, which can be independently manufactured. So you could have now pandemic preparedness for the next next pandemic of any. Um, infection by having the nanolipid um, uh, uh, particle manufactured independently of the RNA and stored in trillions uh, as a portion of pandemic preparedness. And then finally on the right is the protein. And what's exciting is the RBD trimer, the spike, etc. could be built through plant-based manufacturer at low cost, large volume. And in fact, across the world, there are now the beginnings of this RBD um, trimer uh, being developed. It could also be developed in yeast, and that's the Baylor um, um, technology. But it will require an adjuvant, and the adjuvant platforms, which is uh, the alum uh, or the uh, 3ML52 and other adjuvants, we will bring to the table. What um, has been an exciting challenge for us, and we've taken on that challenge, is under one roof, one company of Nantworks, Immunity Bio, Nant Africa, is to build and scale all three of these platforms and put all three of these platforms into uh, clinical trials. Um, the DNA platform is in trial, the RNA DNA platform is about to enter trial, and the protein adjuvant is about to enter into trials. So that one could then test uh, not only the safety and immunogenicity and have the capacity to mix and match. And the next slide, for example, is in which um, the next generation nucleic acid vaccine of an mRNA adjuvant added to a DNA vaccine. Um, as you see on the right hand side, uh, this DNA vaccine has been published in Frontiers in Immunology. And this work was done in collaboration with uh, NIH and BADA and the Battelle uh, Institute. And what they were able to show uh, using our vaccine is that uh, both a oral as well as subcutaneous injection uh, with an oral boost protected non-human primates from a, a COVID viral challenge to the point that there was full protection uh, even after the viral challenge without uh, um, uh, any evidence of a virus in the nose and, uh, and lungs after seven days. This is a program we're about to uh, launch uh, uh, pending approval from um, SAPRA uh, in South Africa called Temba 1. We really are in phase two uh, with Sasanki Boost in which the DNA vaccine is now the boost to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and we're waiting the results of the phase two. The next trial, next slide, is the trial of taking on the um, subunit protein with the adjuvants and in collaboration with Bela and Idri. Um, again, as you see from this publication uh, in Science Immunology, this, this is a yeast-based RBD vaccine formulated with 3MO52. Again, promotes uh, protective efficacy in non-human primates. So, these are very active programs, slide 14, in which um, this quest for a universal, durable COVID-19 vaccine are all being undertaken uh, by us uh, from a DNA to RNA and a protein. So before I turn my attention to the manufacturing element of it, let's divert a little bit to cancer. And in cancer, and the concept of regenerative medicine and working together with University of Witwatersrand and University of Cape Town, 
we will be building both cancer and regenerative medicine programs. Um, the first cancer program would be um, in the use of these natural killer cells. We're able to now grow these natural killer cells, billions of these cells, and transfuse them as an outpatient. We can freeze them so that they're ready to use. Next slide. And as you can see from this video, it's the most effective, if the video could play, um, killer of cancer by targeting towards the cancer cell and literally killing it as, um, as you can see, it, it serially kills and um, can be given as an outpatient. So one could then grow this to an unlimited supply um, in Africa for Africans. It changes the paradigm of cancer care. And we had multiple clinical trials uh, at uh, Immunity Bio today uh, across uh, the use of this uh, um, for pancreatic cancer, triple negative breast cancer, head and neck cancer, colon cancer. Um, and I'm very excited about the opportunity to bring this to Africa. So how did we go about this in the United States over the last decade? Well, we knew that we needed to build large scale manufacturing under one roof, under one organization with freedom to operate, build our own know-how, freedom of technology so that we have the ability to, to transfer this technology. And as you could see, the enormous number of facilities that we have built across uh, in privately held company networks together with our publicly supported companies, Immunity Bio, 17 facilities dedicated to manufacturing and distribution across California, Colorado, and Illinois. These are GMP large scale, um, 100, 100,000 square feet plus facilities uh, associated amongst themselves in a campus lab for not a way so that there's ease of um, independent manufacturing of different platforms. Next slide. Process science and development um, was also needed. And as I said, shared with you, our R&D facility down below uh, became uh, larger as we uh, developed advanced manufacturing techniques, advanced manufacturing um, systems, including things which we'll share with you down the line called GMP in the box, as, as well as research facilities, both in California um, and as well in um, Boston. One of the, the things that was really clear to us very early on was the need for large scale GMP manufacturing equipment. And as you could see, the next slide, the, the need to actually bring and uh, on board this large scale manufacturing, really integrate them in a very sophisticated way. Next slide. So that uh, these could all be operated. And this is the know-how. Uh, more important than the patents of how to actually scale and cry preserve these manufacturing techniques. And the goal then is to bring all of this uh, into Africa. Next slide. And finally, and my closing is what is the next steps? Um, well, we want to deliver everything I've learned from 1978 to 2020, 2021 to bring it home across cellular therapies, RNA, adenovirus, and adjuvants. This is what we call second generation vaccines uh, and manufacture them in Africa for Africa. But not just vaccines, next slide, but also cell therapy and deliver this, these advanced manufacturing techniques, including the artificial intelligently controlled box that could grow without a human being touching anything, um, allowing cells to grow and also cryopreserving cells that they've been given. And I'd like to announce today, um, as I've announced with uh, President Ramaphosa, that uh, we have um, acquired um, manufacturing campuses uh, now in, in South Africa. And this is a, a highlight of about 33,000 square meter campus in which DNA RNA, subunit protein, adjuvants, and monoclonal antibodies, both upstream and downstream, will be built. Next slide. Um, this is the present view of these campuses, um, facilities that would be sufficiently scaled by 2022, 
and with advanced manufacturing techniques, large scale vaccine and monoclonal antibody manufacturing, mRNA upstream and downstream manufacturing. Um, and the ambition is to take this on running um, and by 2022 have a um, the, 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 the nation's first full GMP plant-based manufacturing, full GMP um, self-amplifying RNA and adjuvant manufacturing facility. So I thank you for your time. Um, I look forward to, to listening to, to, to Ed's talk about uh, the, the opportunity to take plant-based manufacturing and to be working with the University of Cape Town.